we'll all stand before the Lord. And I never forget one time as a deaf preacher, he called me up when I was a teenager. That's what every teenager wants is to be called up on the platform, you know, in the middle of service. He called, he was a preacher and he's deaf and, and he said, uh, you, come here, you know. And I'm like, me? And he's like, yeah, you, come here. I'm like, oh my. He called me up there and he says, uh, he says, one of these days you're going to stand before God. He goes, what are you going to do when you meet him face to face? And I'm there on the platform and I thought about it for a moment and I thought, well, this is what I do. And I just got down on my knees and he said, that's exactly right. And, uh, and uh, the truth of the matter is, man, one of these days we'll see him and we'll bow on our knees and yes. we'll cry holy, holy to the Lamb of God. Joshua chapter number 10, Joshua chapter number 10, with the Lord's help tonight, I'm going to preach this message that I have entitled, Is Anything Too Hard for God? As we're taking our, our lessons here on these Wednesday nights and journeying to the promised land and, and getting the children there, we've already crossed over Jordan, we are there, man, we're in the promised land, and the children of Israel are finding some battles there, they are battling uh, from within. They had sin in the camp with Achan, and God had to take care of that, and he did. And uh, then there's battles from without, and uh, all the different enemies of God, AI, and, and we uh, talked about Gibeon last week. And, uh, and that brings us to chapter number 10, and uh, some interesting uh, 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 verbiage here, and I think the Lord will use it in our hearts tonight. But in Joshua chapter number 10, in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass... When uh, Adonai Zedek, get it right in a minute, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, uh, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, as one of the royal cities. And because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty, wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their host, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent uh, unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord just comforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Ezekiah and unto Makedah. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto uh, Azekah, and they died. They were no more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua unto the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still 
upon Gibeon, and, th and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had a For the Lord fought for Israel. Now, my God, I thank you this evening that we can preach your word. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to be a blessing to these thy people. And Father, thank you for the word of God. Sometimes we read some things and it's absolutely amazing. Father, we're so thankful that you are the, the God that amazes us all the time. And Father, tonight I pray that you'll help me as I try to attempt to tell your people tonight that there is nothing too hard for God. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we find tonight in our scripture that there are five cities that band together uh, against, uh, for the purpose of taking out Gibeon, which was now a new province to Israel. You remember last time we were together, we talked about the Gibeonites. And, uh, and remember, we talked about the picture of the, 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 the world, the flesh, and the devil. Gibeonites were a picture of the devil. You say, how were they a picture of the devil? They were a picture of the devil in that they were deceitful. Remember how they came to the children of Israel last Wednesday? The Gibeonites came and they had uh, moldy bread and they had broken bottles and everything and, they, and they, they put on distressed clothing and they came to the children of Israel and they said, we have come from a land far, far away. We have heard of your greatness and we just came to see it for ourselves. Wanted to know if we could join up with you and, uh, and if you would just make a, a, a covenant with us that you won't take our lives and that we could be joined up with you. And, uh, and so Joshua, who was uh, initially a little suspicious about them, uh, he should have investigated and interrogated a little bit longer. Uh, he took their word for it and he made a league with the Gibeonites and in doing so, uh, he made a covenant with them and he could not break his covenant because he swore by the God of heaven. And so with this, now there's this league between uh, Israel and the Gibeonites. And, uh, and so these other five nations said, all right, well, let's just go and take over the Gibeonites. And if all five of us work together, uh, then certainly uh, Israel is, will be no match for us. We just need to work together, you know. Many hands make light work. And so let's get together on this. So these five Amorite cities had now formed an alliance to take out Gibeon and therefore weaken Israel. But it didn't work out as they had planned. It was five on one. And you would say, oh, certainly the odds were in their favor. They're certainly going to win. But let's not ever forget that with God, you are the majority, not the minority. And, uh, and so they were in the majority there. And uh, what God did is God allowed the children of Israel. He strengthened their, their hands for war, and God had fought with the children of Israel, uh, and then as he sent those five cities on the run, and they're running uh, with their tail between their legs uh, there, uh, the Bible said that God in heaven uh, began to cast down stones from heaven. Can you imagine that? Uh, these, these hail stones, and, and, and can you imagine almost like it was a snowball fight? And, uh, and God's got these hailstones, and they're running, and God's whipping them at these, at these people, and is taking one out after another, and, and uh, he's probably throwing a little faster than that, you know, and just knocking them all down, one after another, and, uh, and as he's throwing these snowball-type hailstones at these men, and just destroying them, uh, you can almost see him uh, telling the children of Israel, I told you I was going to protect you, you know, if I got to throw hailstones, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to take care of you. And, uh, and then, for 24 hours, God made the sun to stand still so that Israel could defend themselves against these Amorite cities. Joshua prayed and said, we just need some more daylight. If we had some more daylight, if somehow the sun would just stand still and we just had a little bit more time, we could certainly defeat our enemies. 
And so Joshua prayed a prayer that had to be impossible. God, I want you to do something. I want you to make the sun to stand still. Now you and I understand uh, what Joshua was praying, basically what Joshua understood. We say this phrase, you know, and we sing a song, the sun's coming up in the morning. And the truth of the matter is, the sun doesn't come up. The earth spins. That's what happens. You know, and, uh, and, and, but we understand what Joshua was praying for, but I don't even know if Joshua understood what he was praying for. But Joshua prayed for what you and I now know through science and technology to be impossible. The sun can't stand still. What he was asking was for God to stop the earth from spinning, or at least to slow it down. Now, you and I also know that that can't happen. You know, the earth must spin in order for things to be where they are. You know, we would be in utter catastrophic chaos. It'd be over for us if the earth ever stood still. And so Joshua prays to the God of heaven and he says, uh, God, I need the sun to stand still. Uh, friend, uh, uh, scoffers uh, of this portion of scripture try to disprove the, the Bible. Uh, and they say, uh, the first they talk about how Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. And they say, you know, the sun's not that, that moves. It, it, the earth is what moves around the sun. And we say, well, we know exactly what Joshua was talking about. Uh, there, That's a simple one. Then they say, if the earth earth really stood still for 24 hours that the events would cause uh, such a thing that would be so catastrophic. Uh, and we understand that. But, uh, of course it would, but what we also understand is that the God who created it all and put all this in motion and into existence uh, certainly can keep uh, catastrophic events from taking place. He's the God who spoke it all into existence. Of course he can keep it all from falling all apart. By the way, uh, it's interesting, you can look at accounts around the globe of this day that was longer than any other day. It's very interesting. Some liberal Christians even say that, that, that this is obviously a poetic language and it's not to be taken literally. And I say, I don't believe it to be poetic language at all. I take it very literally. If Joshua prayed for God to let the sun stand still and give him more daylight and God said that he did it, uh, then friend, God said it, that settles it. One believes that God slowed down the earth's rotation uh, to take double the amount of time uh, than, than, than normal. And, uh, and, and, and I say, you know, I kind of lean toward that one. I think what God did was he took the earth and, and he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to slow it down. And so he, he made it take twice as long to make one revolution as it normally would. And so basically one minute was not one minute, it was two minutes. And one hour was not one hour, it was two hours. And so God doubled the time that the sun was up there in the sky, and he did it for Joshua. He just simply slowed everything down, you know? He just put his finger on the record player. Now, kids have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Let me say, maybe, maybe you do, you know? Sometimes kids like these throwback things and want to get retro on us, you know? So maybe some kids do. But uh, when we were kids, we could take our finger and put it on the record, and it would just go from, you know, singing it, just low, you know? And you slow the record down. And, uh, and that's all that God did with his finger. He just slowed everything down. And he gave Joshua all the time that he needed. How God did it really makes no difference. The Bible says that he did it, and that pretty much settles it. And so we're asking our question then, uh, is anything too hard for God? In fact, do me a favor, and, uh, and, and, and I want you to hold your place there, maybe a ribbon or something, but I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. And, uh, and, and, and as you're turning there, uh, I, I'm going to hold my finger in Genesis 18 myself, and, uh, and you're welcome to do the same. And, uh, and I'm going to hold my place over in, uh, in Jeremiah 32 because I want to read these two verses back to back, one right after another. So I'm going to go Genesis 18 and verse 14, and then I'm going to flip immediately over to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. 
And, uh, and I just want to read these two verses back to back for you. And maybe what you want to do is right there in your Bible next to Genesis 18 and verse number 14. Maybe you want to write down the reference Jeremiah 32, 17. And uh, it's, it, you'll see why in just a moment. You'll be glad that you did. And in Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 14, we'll just read the first question there from Genesis 4, uh, 18 and verse number 14. Your Bible says this. It says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now quickly, Jeremiah 32, 17. Oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. <laughs> I like when the Bible asks a question and then the Bible answers that same question. Is there anything too hard for God? There's nothing too hard for thee. And he says, you created it all. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Joshua asked a very hard thing. Joshua said, Lord, I need more time. I need more daylight. God, I need you to slow it all down. And Joshua, uh, the Lord put his hand on the earth and slowed it all down for Joshua. And if God can slow down the solar system and still keep everything from flying into utter chaos and catastrophic events, then I would say that God can answer your prayer and he can answer my prayer. I'd say tonight that there is nothing too hard for God. I've seen a lot of people ask a lot of things in my life and I've read a lot of people asking for a lot of things from God in the Bible. But I've never heard or seen anybody ask God to make the whole solar system stand still. That's a big one. That's, that's got to be the biggest Stop everything. Slow it all down. Is God big enough to do it? The answer to that question is absolutely he is. So let me give you some things here tonight. There is nothing too hard for God. First of all, there is no promise too hard for God to keep. There is no promise too hard for God to keep. I'm going to have you do a lot of turning. It's Wednesday night. We're ready for that. It's Bible study. So numbers in chapter number 23. Quickly, numbers 23. And then look with me, if you would, at verse number 19. In Numbers 23 and verse number 19, the Bible says here, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Oh, friend, the Bible's asking this rhetorical question. Of course, if he said it, he's going to do it. You and I, we have been let down by people. And friend, we have let people down because we're humans. There have been times where we said we're going to do something. We're going to be here at this particular time or whatever. And we've, we've not kept our end of the bargain. But there's never been a time where God's not kept his end of the bargain. God is in time, on time, every time. When God says it, you can bank on it. He's going to do it. And so that's why I like these songs like we sing in our hymn book. I love our hymn book. And we sing songs like, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. I like standing on the promises. I like leaning on the everlasting arms. And tonight I want to show you a few promises uh, that you can stand on tonight that are promises from God. There's nothing too hard for the Lord, and there's no promise too hard for God to keep. Let me give them to you. They're going to be in rapid order. So we see how you're turning, turning fingers ready, and if you're taking notes, you'll want to write them down. Here's some promises that you can stand on tonight. First of all, the promise of salvation, Titus chapter number one. Titus in chapter number one, you'll go to your New Testament. Titus chapter number one and verse number two. And these are only sub points on my first main point. And so therefore, I'm going to need you to listen fast as I preach fast. And, uh, but Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. The Bible says, and if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to underline every time you see the word promise in these verses of Scripture of which I give you. There is no promise too hard for God to keep. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. 
Can I tell you, you have a promise tonight that you can stand on. You can stand on the promise of eternal life. That's a good one. You say, why is it a good one? Because if you're like me, there are days that you don't really feel saved. There are days, maybe if you're like me, where you look back on, on who you used to be and things you, you've done, and you say, there's no way, there's no way that I could be saved. There's no way that, 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 that I, could, I could have eternal life and, and all of this. But then you, you remind yourself from the Word of God that God promised you He'll wash away all your sins and forgive us of all of our sins and He'll save our soul. Hey, we, we remind ourselves what the Bible says and we say, I can stand on the promise that if I ask the Lord to save me, then hey, he saved me. That's a promise you can stand on. You know, I ask people all the time, you 100% sure you're going to heaven? And sometimes they'll say, well, how can anybody be sure? I say, I am. You say, how? Because I have a promise and God cannot lie. He's not a man like us. And all I'm doing, it's not, not that I have some kind of supernatural strength or faith. I'm just standing on a promise, and God cannot lie. I'll give you another one. How about the promise of the Holy Spirit? Galatians chapter 3. I would just have people turn to these tonight and then read them for us, because my, my thumb, my turning finger is, is injured tonight. I keep trying to grab it, and, uh, and, and i got a bandage on myself here, but we'll get her done here. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 14. All right, you're marking. If you see the word promise, you're underlining it, right? Here we go, Galatians 3, 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Oh, friend, we have another promise we can stand on. We have the promise of the Spirit. Sometimes Baptists are scared to death of the Holy Spirit. We've given the Holy Spirit away to the Pentecostals. I say, let's not do that. Well, what are we so afraid of? We're saved. When you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, did you not realize that the Holy Spirit took up residence inside of your spirit? What? Know ye not that your body is... Hey, you're the temple of God. The Holy Spirit resides in your spirit. And if you will yield to the Holy Spirit in your life and wave the white flag and surrender and say, not my will, but thine be done, and you yield to the Holy Spirit, then you will have evidence in your life, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. These will become attributes of your own life as you are yielded to the Holy Ghost of God. And He is now working through you. Like Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost confusing if you ever slow down and listen to what he's saying. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, meaning I'm dead. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, uh, yet I live. <laughs> yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And all this goes back and forth. He says, I'm dead, but I'm alive. How? The Holy Spirit's living through me. And that's a promise. That's a promise that you can rest upon. If you yield to the Holy Spirit, he will lead you and guide your life. And you know it'll change your life. There's no reason why Christians need to walk around angry and bitter. We have the joy of the Lord. You're missing on it when you're not yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. So we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. Here's another one, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, we're almost there. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. The Bible says here, Ephesians 1, 13, the Bible says, In whom ye have trust, also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit, and there's that word again, of promise. The Bible says that not only will the Lord save us, but he will seal you, he will keep you. You are sealed. That's called eternal security. That's a promise. Did you see the word promise there? God said, I've got another promise for you. There's nothing too hard for God. There's no promise too great that God cannot keep. And God said, if I saved you, I will not only save you, but I will keep you saved. I'm so thankful for that one. Because let me just be honest with you, I'd be the one that lose my salvation before anybody. But I'm not, I'm not the one that keeps me saved. The Lord keeps me saved. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm glad the Lord's the one that's able to do that. We have the promise of eternal security. Uh, Ephesians 3, 6. We'll stay in Ephesians for a little bit. Ephesians 3 and verse number 6. Here's another one. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs uh, and of the same body and partakers of his promise 
in Christ by the gospel. You have the promise of adoption. The promise of adoption. Oh, praise the Lord. One of these days, the placing of sons. The Lord will call us out of here. In my, my, my. The promise of adoption. I'll give you another one. Second Peter. Second Peter, would you go there? Uh, we're not too far from there. Uh, Second Peter. Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, uh, James, Peter, Peter, 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse number 4. The Bible says here in 2 Peter, chapter 3, and verse number 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now look down at verse number 9, please. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We find out here, they were asking, where is the promise of the second coming of Christ? And the Bible says, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise. If the Lord said he's going to come back again, you can mark it down. He is coming again. There is no promise too hard for God to keep. If God promised you salvation, he's going to give you salvation. If he promised you the Holy Spirit, you'll get it. If he promised you eternal security, it's yours. If he promised you the spirit of adoption, it's yours. If he promised you the rapture of the church, it's yours. And it's coming soon. How about this one? The book of James. The book of James. Would you look there quickly? The book of James. And uh, Hebrews, you're close. And you'll find the book of James. Chapter 1 and verse number 12. James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath, oh, here it is again, promised to them that love him. Aren't you glad the Lord's made you some promises? The Lord promised you. If somebody looks at you and says, I promise, I pro little kids, I promise I'll never do it again. I promise. And then they're right back to what they were doing. I promise. When the Lord said, I promise, you can take it to the bank. And the Lord promised right there, what did he promise for you? Rewards for faithfulness. He said, if you're faithful, I'm going to reward you. You can take it to the bank. How about this one? Uh, James chapter 2 and verse number 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? God has promised a home in heaven. And you can mark it down. If God promised you a home in heaven, he's going to keep his promise. Friend, God's promised a lot of things. He promised you to supply your every need. Philippians 4.19 For my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. He promised that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13 We have all kinds of promises in the Bible. He promises you wisdom. In James 1.5 If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth all men liberally and afraideth not. We find out that God has some promises for us that we can claim today. And friend, there is no promise too big for God to keep but let me give you another one. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. Not only is there no promise too hard for God to keep, but there's no prayer too hard for God to answer. I love when God does that which is difficult. For that, that's a wonderful thing. But I really love when God does that which is impossible. For that is miraculous. When God does that which is difficult, it's wonderful. When God does that which is impossible, it's Miraculous. And we thank the Lord for it. You know, there's a woman by the name of Hannah, and she was barren, and she wanted a child. And she prayed, and she believed God, and God gave her the faith, and God let her know there is nothing too hard for me. And Hannah had a baby. The first century church wanted Peter out of prison. And where do you find him at? You find him in a room, and they're praying. And they're praying at the door, and they're saying, they're saying, Oh, God... Get Peter out of prison. He was just preaching, God, get Peter out of prison. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, and Rhoda runs to the door, and Rhoda opens the door, and there's Peter there, standing in front of him, and they're back here behind, praying that God would let Peter out of prison. She slams the door in his face, runs back there, turns around and says, wait a minute, that's Peter. Goes back, opens the door, lets him in, and says, God answered our prayer. Here's Peter. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. George Mueller was praying for food and a bread truck broke down right in front of the orphanage. 
He was praying for milk, and, 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 a, and a milk truck broke down in front of his orphanage and brought him milk. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Dr. Carter went on a, Mickey Carter went on a trip to Israel, and, uh, and he's sitting on a bus, and as they're going through Israel, the people were talking about, you know, uh, look at all the sheep and look at all this, and, and he's thinking to himself, there's no point in me even getting up and looking at the side of this bus. He said, I can't see anyways. I, I have these glasses that I have to wear all the time, and, and I can't see a thing anyways. And, and he had left his glasses on the bus and the hotel, and he's like, I can't see and all of this. And so he said, you know, it, God can probably clear my vision for me if I, if I ask him. He never thought to pray for it. And he felt led of God to pray and ask the Lord to do something for his vision. And he prayed, and he said, God, would you restore my vision? And he said, just as sure as that, the next day, he said, he never into this day. He said, I still didn't need glasses. God restored my vision for me. It's absolutely amazing, you know. And uh, well, he's preached here for us at a, 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 a preacher's fellowship meeting. Curtis Hudson was at a meeting one time, and he prayed for $20. Uh, he was preaching a sort of Lord meeting when he first got started, and he didn't have any gas money. And, uh, and so he prayed, and he said, he said, he said, Lord, I need, uh, not $20, $10. He said, Lord, I need $10 to put gas in this car and get me home. And, uh, and so he was praying that the Lord would provide him with $10, and uh, he didn't know what to do. And, uh, and so he gets, after the meeting's over with, he sits down in his car, and, uh, and, and he passed out the subscription uh, for people, and people would write out they want to take a subscription of the sword of the Lord, and they put an envelope, and they seal it and everything, and so he had all these envelopes sitting next to him, and he thought, well, I've never done this before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it now. He said, I'm going to open up one of these envelopes. And I'm going to take money out of it, but I'm going to put it back when I get back home. I just need to put gas in the car. And so he opened up an envelope, and the very first one he opened up, he pulls it out, and it wasn't a subscription at all. It just says, love offering for Curtis Hudson, and there's a $10 bill in there. And he's like, what? He gets back to the sword office, and he says, how many times has this happened? Because no one's ever given me a love offering yet. And they said, it's never happened before. And uh, it's just amazing how God answers our prayers, no doubt about it. My wife and I, we were uh, flying to Las Vegas to go visit her grandparents, and, uh, and we had just started the church in Homestead. And, uh, and so we, we had uh, taken care of bills and things before we left. And my wife says, well, what do we got? And I said, well, we have $200 left. Uh, you know, and, and she goes, how are we going to live off of that? I said, well, we're going to do our best. And so we pulled out the $200 in cash, and, uh, and we got on the airplane, and we flew to, to Las Vegas there. And while we were flying to Las Vegas, she's got the checkbook out and sitting there, uh, right, you know, filling out all the paperwork and the checkbook and balancing the account. And she's doing that, and I'm reading my Bible because I'm much more spiritual than she is. And, uh, and uh, I'm just kidding. I was reading my Bible because I was scared to death. <laughs> and, uh, and so anyways, uh, she says, honey. And I was like, what? She goes, we messed up. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I forgot we wrote this check. And I was like, oh, no. And then I said, what are we going to do? And, and, and then she's like, what do we do? I said, well, as soon as we land, we've got to put this cash back in the bank because we are going to overdraft. This is bad. And, uh, and so sure enough, we landed, and, and, uh, and, and we, Grandpa was there in the car. And we got in the car, and we, we drove straight to a, the bank that we had, and we deposited the cash back into the account. She says, how are we going to live? I said, I don't know. I just hope Grandpa takes care of us or something, you know. And, uh, and so anyways, we were there, and that was a Saturday. And, uh, and, and she says, hey, we're going to go to the same church tomorrow. And I said, no, we're not. And she goes, we're not going to go to the same church we always go to in Las Vegas when we come? I said, no. And she says, why? I said, I don't know why. I said, I can only tell you, God doesn't want us to go there. She says, why not? I said, I don't know. I'm just telling you, God doesn't want us to go there. And she goes, where are we going to go? I said, I don't know, but we're not going there. And I, I didn't know why, but God was telling me, don't go to that church. And so I pulled up my computer and I typed in, you know, Baptist Church, Las Vegas, all that stuff, you know. And then the churches start <laughs> popping up. And there was one church that was doing this. Wah, wah. Wrong. And uh, I mean, if, to me it was. And I said, that's the church. And she says, how do you know? I said, I don't know, but I'm telling you that's the one God wants us to go to. It's on the other side of Las Vegas. You know how far away it is? I said, I don't care. That's the one God told us to go to. That's the one we're going to. And so we got up and we left the next morning and we went to that church and the pastor uh, met us by the door. His name was Scott Postma. And he met us by the door uh, in the parking lot, actually. And here we are in our church suits and everything, you know, and clothes. And he's thinking, oh, we got we got potential church members here. And so he comes out there, and I'm thinking, I know what he's thinking, so I'm just going to give him a gospel track, let him know who I am, so he'll leave me alone, you know. And he comes over there, and he's like, hey, folks. And I said, hey, I'm just here visiting family. And I said, we started this church in Homestead and all of that. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. 
And then he comes in, we come in, and he sits down on the front seat there, and we're sitting back there, and he's looking at my gospel track and reading it, you know? And then he takes it and puts it in his pocket, and then it's his turn to get up to the microphone, and he comes up and he says, hey folks, he says, uh, we have got some very, very special guests with us today. And I'm like, this is Las Vegas. I mean, this could be Celine Dion. This could be Siegfried and Roy. I mean, I don't know who's here. Maybe the tiger, you know. I mean, but somebody special's here. And, uh, and he's like, we got a special guest here today. And he says, we have church planters. And, uh, and he says, and we got Larry and Elisa Hobbs. Brother Hobbs, would you come up here and would you pray for the church service? And would you, would you say a word and greet the crowd for me today? And I said, sure. And I came up and told him what God had called us to do. And I prayed for the church service. And then I go to step down. He goes, wait, 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 don't go anywhere. And he says, folks, he says, you know I never do this, right? He says, but I feel led of the Lord. He says, ushers, would you come down? I know we've already taken the offering, blah, blah, blah. He said, ushers, come down. He said, I really feel like the Lord wants us to take up a love offering for this couple. And, uh, and he says, ushers, come on down. And so after the church service was over with and everything, he says, stick around. Now I got your love offering. And uh, we stuck around after the church service was over with. He's showing us all around their, the church plant because he's a church planter too. And, uh, and finally, we ended up in the office and the secretary wrote the check. And she goes, here you go. And she handed us a check for $200, which was exactly what I had to put back in. And I just, I mean, she and I, we just cried. And we just said, man, God is good. You know, God answers our prayer. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. And I can continue with illustration after illustration. That's the wonderful thing about being a church planter is you see God do all kinds of amazing things. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 11, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things unto them that ask him? I want you to know tonight that there's no promise too hard for God to keep. There is no prayer too hard for God to answer. There is no problem too hard for God to solve. Nobody is exempt from problems. God did not promise an easy voyage, but he did promise safe travels. And uh, God will keep us safe. Don't let the problems of life get you discouraged. Uh, you can't break not even one of God's promises by leaning on them. You can lean on all the promises you want. When you feel this world is against you, you lean on the everlasting arms. When The world uh, might take a lot from you, but you can't take my joy and world. You cannot take my salvation. World, you might leave me alone, but God will never leave me alone. World, you might turn my family against me, but you cannot turn me away from God. Uh, world, you may reward me with evil, but God will reward me with crowns. World, you may hold me back, but one day the trumpet's going to sound and try to hold me back then because I'm going to glory. Oh, friend, there's no place. Let me give you this. There's no, pl uh, no place too dead for God to revive. There's no place too dead for God to revive. Jesus was a funeral home director's worst nightmare. Anytime Jesus showed up to a funeral, somebody resurrected, you know. And that's what he is in the business of. He's in the revival business. You say, that church is too dead. I say, uh, that's not too hard for God. You say, that nation is too dead. I say, that's not too hard for God. People look at America today and they say, I don't think she's qualified for revival. I don't think that America can have revival. She's gone too far. She's gotten too wicked. She's reprobate. We should just uh, give up on her. It's too much. And I say, friend, that's exactly what my God specializes in. I believe we can see revival. There's no place too dead for God to revive. And I'll give you the last one. There's no person too hard for God to save. No person too hard for God to save. There was no way the paralytic man could have been saved. They brought him through a roof and lowered him down in the midst of the congregation right before the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't tell me there's not a way. First Timothy 1.15 says this, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that, Jesus, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul said these words, I am the chief of sinners. I want you to know this. There is no person too hard for God to save. You say, well, you don't understand my son, my daughter, my sister, my brother, my family member. There's no way they will ever get saved. Friend, there is no person too hard for God to save. Paul was the chief of sinners. And if God can save the chief, then I'm sure he can save all the Indians too. And he can save your loved one. Oh, friend, there's no soul too hard for God to save. There's nothing 
too hard for God. Father, I love you now, and thank you for your many blessings. I thank you, dear Lord, that there's nothing too hard for thee. And Father, we have sometimes in our heart things that we think are so difficult, but I, I doubt that anybody's ever prayed for the solar system to stand still. If you did that for Joshua, all the things you could do for us. Father, thank you that you're a God that hears and answers prayer. And Father, tonight, I pray that we'll continue to be people of faith, walking close to you. And Father, bless us and help us, dear Lord Jesus. Father, maybe there's some here tonight who are heavily burdened about a loved one, a family member who's lost or away from you. And there's been times they've been tempted to give up on them and stop praying for them, thinking they're too far gone. But I know there's no person too hard for you to save. Father, maybe there's some other issue in their life and they think there's no way that God can break through. Help us to understand the God that we serve tonight. There's no promise too hard for you to keep. There's no prayer for, too hard for you to answer. There's no problem for you that's too hard to solve. And there's no place too dead for you to revive. Father, I think of my country tonight. Greatest country on earth. She needs revival. She needs to see you seated on your throne. She needs to get back to the book. Father, we've done a lot of evil things in this land. And we need your mercy. Father, we need a country that's turned back to God. And where you are, are, the, are, 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 are the Lord. And Father, I pray that you'll heal our land again. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. May you be put back in your rightful place in regards to the United States of America. Father, send a revival through our land. Bless this invitation time. Use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Shall we stand together, please? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Brother Jeremy begins to play. Friend, if the Lord spoke to your heart, I'd invite you to step out from where you are and come down now to an old-fashioned altar. And you'll find a God there at the altar who's ready to meet with you. And you're going to find that there's no prayer too hard for him. There's no promise too hard for him. There's no person too hard that God can't revive. Is it that wayward child? Don't give up. Don't give up. Pray for him. They're not too far gone. We serve a big, strong, mighty God who can stop the whole solar system. If he can do that, he can change the heart of your loved one. I pray for Mike Dugan, family of the week. I ask you that you'll use his life, dear Lord, in a great way. Keep him safe. Give him good health. Father, be with Pastor Matt Boer, Laura, the children. Thank you for their ministry there in Georgia. And I pray, dear Lord, you'll continue to bless them. I pray tonight for our government and, uh, and, and all that's going on there, dear Lord. I just pray, uh, dear Lord, that you'll uh, right the wrongs that are in our land. And, uh, and, and Father, take care of, of, of those who... Uh, what only what's their own interest and not what's best for our country. Father, I pray that you'll be with our police officers, be with a uh, lady who was killed in the line of duty there in Chicago. I pray for all those police officers out there that you'll keep them safe. We live in a day and age in which, uh, Lord, their, their lives don't seem to be valued, but Lord, we're thankful for those that keep us safe. Father, I pray that you'll be with our church and finances and growth and add to us those you want to add, keep from us those you don't want us to have. And Father, we do pray that you'll be with the different ministries. I think tonight the nursing home and the bus ministry and the, the, the juvenile prison ministry, uh, dear Lord, be with these, especially that nursing home and the juvenile prison, dear Lord, open the door. Father, be with our nurses. We thank you for them. Protect them. Keep them safe. Uh, tonight, uh, dear Lord, we pray for uh, the, the man who's got COVID, whose wife is a nurse here that works with Anya. And Father, I just pray that you'll be with him and especially touch him. Be with Miss Myra as she goes in for a CT scan. 
Uh, dear Lord, I pray for a good report. That's what we're begging you for. It's what we need. Dear Lord, I, I'm asking you for some tokens of good on this one. And uh, Father, give us a good report. Father, we pray for Miss Kimmy. And uh, thank you, dear Lord, for the miracle of birth and children. And, uh, and Father, how I ask you, dear Lord, that you'll keep her safe and little Emmy safe. And uh, we'll thank you for that. Father, I pray for Brother Wadika as he's re uh, recovering from COVID. Thank you, dear Lord, for uh, the, the miracle and, uh, that you have performed in his life. And thank you, dear Lord, for ivermectin and how it's healed him up and so many others. And Father, I pray that uh, the word will get out and uh, that it won't be something that people are trying to keep from folks as we have seen evidence, much evidence, that it helps people. And Father, we just pray for Rachel with COVID and intubated. And Father, we ask that you'll be with her. I pray, dear Lord, for Caleb, this young man. I'm thankful to hear a good report that he seems to be doing a lot better sitting up and eating, but he's got a long road ahead of him. I pray for our dear, sweet Mrs. Gwen, uh, dear Lord, and she's going in for a stent. I know she's nervous, and she's got uh, the issues there with, with her son, Stephen, and, uh, and that situation, and then also with Kevin. And she's got a lot on her plate. And I ask you, dear Lord, that you'll just be with her and calm her nerves. May she know that you're going to take care of everything, and she has a church family that loves her. I pray that we'll reach out to her and just maybe send her a text or a call and just let her know we're praying for her and everything's going to be all right. Father, these different folks who go in for procedures and things and they can't see their family members because of all this uh, insane amount of fear that's being perpetrated on our people, Father, I just pray that you'll help these folks. Father, we pray for Caden as he'll be traveling home even today. Give him traveling mercies. I pray for Charlene. I'm glad she came to church tonight. I pray that you'll be with her and help her with the financial situation and housing situation. I pray for Anya's mother, uh, dear Lord, and for good health. Please touch and do a mighty work there. And then, Father, we praise your name. We praise you for Brother Doug Fisher. So glad that he's home. I just ask you, dear Lord, that you'll continue to do a work there. His faith is just so incredible to me. And I just thank you for the example that he is being right now. His faith, as he had living faith and serving faith, and then now at the trials of life, and he's got faith, and he has just been an encouragement to me from a distance for many years, and I'm so thankful for him. I thank you for each and every one of our missionaries, dear Lord. It was so wonderful to hear from Brother Cooey this week and his encouraging words and just calling me and saying, I just wanted to hear your voice. And uh, what a blessing to have men of God like that that care about me uh, in this world. Bless all of our missionaries and use them in a great way. Brother Glenn Sebat's in the middle of a prison revival right now. Use his life in a great way. Father, thank you that we had a place to come in tonight. Thank you for air conditioning and padded pews. Father, I just pray that you'll bless us now with safety as we go. Uh, Lord, I heard there's some kind of hurricane out west uh, of us in the Gulf are uh, heading that way. Father, we ask for your protection. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for your love, your goodness to us. Bless us now as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, let's sing a song. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. We'll be on our way. Ready? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open, and the blessings are falling tonight. For there's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old and garments, and he gave me your wife. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy to God. God bless you. I love you. You're dismissed. Thanks for being in church. Thank you so much for being a part of our church service. I hope you enjoyed the message and the music and all that was involved in the church service today. Now listen, something very important is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you'll visit our website, the web address is www.fcbc.biz. If you go to our website, there's a tab, a drop-down bar, and on it, it says the word salvation. If you'll click on that word salvation, it'll pull up a web page that tells you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. In fact, it tells you how to be born again. That's most important. Everybody needs to know how to be born again. I hope you'll take the time to read through that, and if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I hope that you'll do that. And listen, if you're ever in the area, we'd love for you to come by and visit with us here at the great Flagler County Baptist Church. Tell everyone about us. God bless you. Thanks for being a part.